Folks, we are here. Dr. James, Dr. Mike, how's it going? Um, before we got on the air, we were talking about Metallica, and <laughs> I just found out that James loves the songwriting process Metallica has. Oh. He loves the documentaries oh. about Metallica, and he likes mostly Metallica's biggest hits that you hear on the radio. God, so cringy. Mike and I worked, I was, we, I watched uh, some kind of monster recently again for the second time now, uh, pff, 10 years or whatever later. And I forgot how cringy it was. So we were laughing about that. Dude, <laughs> I got to tell you, um, I did the thing where I, I accidentally overreached my forearms from doing yard work, just, just doing stuff around the house. And, um, my God, I can't do anything today. Like it's been like three days since it happened and it's just been like so tight and so sore and like everything I touch is just like sending shock waves down my arms. And I had to do my heavy bench workout today, which is like bench, some dumbbells, like typical, you know, international bench day kind of stuff. But then I also had to do some like curls and stuff. And I was just like, oh my God, my, my fucking forearms and they're taking forever to heal. It's like once you cross that threshold on forearms, it sucks. It you takes take care of yourself, man. Dude, I'm so I'm I'm hurting. I'm hurting now. Even just doing barbell like bench, I was like, oh, my arms. Well, I got a VR system, and I haven't. Oh, been like like an oh, Oculus. Oh, like an Oculus Quest Two, and I, I I definitely haven't been watching VR porn <laughs> at all, and it's definitely not pretty fucking sweet at all. So I'm overreach form wise too. I feel you on that. So so you got the Coculus. Oh, yes. It actually goes on the cock. Um, I don't know what my cock sees, but apparently a lot because it really likes it. Because it's, it's getting a workout. <laughs> People are like, how is VR? How are the colors and stuff? Like, I don't know. I put it on my cock. It works out fine. It'd be sweet if like Normatech and Oculus did like a, a mashup and they made the cockulus. So then it actually like does like the pressure on your wiener and then you get the full, full experience. You know, <laughs> I, was, I was giving that some thought. Why not spend a couple minutes here? So I was giving them some thought. And I thought, okay, like uh, in a lot of these videos, it's like it's obviously almost all POV because non POV VR is strange because you feel like you're just a dude standing in a room with you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, why am I here? Why is no one acknowledging me? <laughs> but uh, in, in, if they do acknowledge you, it's even weirder. Oh my but, god! Um, you know, you think like, okay, so like it would be really cool if while the guy was banging, you could feel like the banging in your dick, right? Like the the Norma Tech would do this or whatever. But then you're like, you know, I'm kind of feeling my own swag when I'm banging. And what if the guy's banging too hard? Or what if he like stops and switches positions when you're about to nut? Like, you know what <laughs> I'm saying? Gotta, you just got to go for it. You just got to go for it. And that, that's when, that, when the porn companies are like, come on, guy, what else do you want here? You want to fucking jizz in this thing or not? Get a, get, get, oh, get, and then you the cleaning. 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 Mm. When I, we have another story. I think, I think this is what we would call first world problems like it's beyond it's future problems it's like if 20 years ago people were like what really that's a problem you're like oh i mean yeah the future is really cool but yeah semen still comes out and i don't know what to do after i would love to try and explain that to somebody like in the past like abraham lincoln like so i know you're dealing with the civil war stuff right now but man in the future this calculus it's a mess so bad i know what? you've got it bad but look it's terrible uh <laughs> Yeah, I was trying, I was talking to somebody, I'll, I'll admit who, but like how how men deal with uh, the post-coital state, like, mm, and especially like post-masturbation. It's not like you sit there and you're like, ah, usually I'm just like, ugh. There's like a self these people on my theory. computer screen? Yeah, yeah dude, like, I don't want to see you people. Ugh. Get away from me. The appeal of, of porn stars instantly drops from the greatest thing ever to like, I would rather not see that go to, away to like full existential crisis. Like what was yeah, I just like, doing for why the last 20 me? minutes? Yes. Yeah. Also, and, and I was the same, same conversation. I was like, you know, when guys hook up, the average response I think is like that with physical, actual people too. <laughs> like if right. you hook up after a party and after you do the deed, you're like, so Uber <laughs> instead yeah. of like, I want to know your soul. Get out of here. Nobody wants to know shit about you. Joe Rogan had a stand up bit about that of like you sh for guys like you should always just bust a nut before making any important decisions because it always like if you're horny like it always just points you in the wrong direction. Oh yes. <laughs> oh yes. Oh yeah. All right. So, speaking of things that are actually training related, mm -hmm. let's go to our first question Aska. Uh Daniel Brown, fresh off of writing all those books with Tom Hanks as the actor and the 
the, you know, the uh, Catholic everything. What was oh, it? the Da Vinci ones or whatever it's called? The Da Vinci it's Code. Code. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there must be so many porn knockoffs of the Da Vinci Code. Da Vinci um, Cock. <laughs> we got to actually do some work today. We've been just talking about dicks for the last like 10 minutes already. We got to get going here. That one is great because it's not even clever. It's just, <laughs> Those just are the best in. ones. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We just lost like 5,000 subscribers. 5, subscribers. Not, do they talk about fitness at all or just dicks? <laughs> The thing is, I'm trying to think of other ones, and I can't because that one's so good. It's the best instantly. It's like winning the Olympics on your first try of a sport. You're done. That's it. Go home. Enjoy. All right. Daniel Brown. I can't even read his name anymore. <laughs> oh, focus. 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 I'm going to, I'm actually taking a flight later today. I'm going to be sitting next to someone and be like, what do you do for work? And I'll be like, well, my colleague and I, we did work earlier today. Uh, I'm looking for investors in a new movie, a new series of films. <laughs> Are you interested? They're like, well, this is an adult spoof of the Da Vinci Code. They're like, oh, I have all kinds of ideas about the name. They're like, no, no, we already have a name. <laughs> no, we got that. New. It's covered. All right. <laughs> Daniel Brown says, hey, docs, how would you recommend programming in cardio for the benefits of actually improving cardiovascular fitness in terms of frequency slash duration, et cetera? Would you also focus on specific heart rate zones as a measure of productivity? Thanks in advance. So I'll give my two cents and then James will probably do a better job. So one thing is you have to pick the modality because the modality is important. Now, if the modality is not important to you, cross training is probably best where you know, like swim two, twice a week and then like elliptical twice a week and then jog twice a week or something. What that allows you to do is to spread the local fatigue around so that you can only generate systemic fatigue and great cardiovascular adaptations. But like, you know, your feet don't start hurting too much from running too much. Your shoulders don't beat you up because you swim too much. So if overall cardiovascular fitness is your goal, I would actually recommend um, using multiple modalities, maybe two or three. Uh, you know, as access allows and convenience allows. And then frequency and duration, I mean, it depends on how far you want to take this thing. I would say at least three to four times per week uh, as far as frequency as a start. But serious folks who want to be very cardiovascularly fit, do some sort of cardio chief five to seven times a week. One of those being kind of like a, a very, very easy quote unquote workout where you maybe just jog for five minutes at the beginning of the day and then, and then cool off. A lot of people who do very high end uh, cardiovascular fitness, especially athletes, they don't actually take a whole lot of days off because cardiovascular adaptations, specifically local muscular adaptations to cardio, um, they, they recede real quick. So you don't want to really like ever, it's not like lifting where you like get eh, four days a week. Like mm, you may get something. You may just like the first day back after three days off is like, Oh, my shins are blowing up. <laughs> the hell is have i never done this before so that's something to consider and as far as um duration and intensity etc my easiest thing would just be to start at something that feels pretty challenging that after five to ten minutes you get pretty winded and you're like fuck this i can't do this anymore and then slowly work up as your body adapts right because that frequency duration example or the we can't actually give you a broad range of definitions of, of what those ranges are like oh 20 minutes X, xyz because like some people are in such bad shape Two minutes would be terrible for them. Other people, for them, you know, an hour would be insufficient. And one thing I'd say is a really good thing to throw in there is we, um, intervals are really great. And that doesn't mean hard intervals. That means like you run around the block, right? Well, you can't run around the block because you'll gas out after one block. So what you can do is like uh, jog half a block and then walk the other three quarters or whatever. So jog a quarter then walk, 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 jog, walk, 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 jog. And that can allow you, as you're walking, you're still like recovering. And by the time you reach the next block, you are ready to, to do a little run again. And then what you can do later is increase this, the pace of the run. And then maybe you can add in one of the quarters of the block, also jog. And eventually you're jogging the whole thing. And eventually you're jogging miles, but it's all adjusted. And remember, deloads are still important. So, you know, every four to eight weeks, you should take at least half of a week of very, very easy training maybe do more swimming and things like that to offload your joints. You're going to feel much better coming back. And then you start working back up James. Wow. Really good answer. Also, I'll just throw a couple other things in that uh, I think are important. So like Mike said, for most people, um, you have to, you have to consider like kind of building up a little bit. So a lot of people are like, I want to get into cardio. Well, it's like, you don't just throw somebody into a really, really hard hypertrophy program if they're not currently lifting weights. Right. So it's the same kind of idea where you would want to start. If you're not doing cardio, you want to start doing something real easy, maybe two times a week, relatively low intensity. Once you kind of get built up to like, I'm a, a cardio person, like some cardio is something that I do very regularly, 
Um, I would recommend, and this is kind of in the context of, I'm assuming, Daniel, that you are also doing a hypertrophy program. I think pretty much everybody who subscribes to this channel is hypertrophy focused in some capacity. So I would say within a hypertrophy program, you know, two to three times per week is pretty good. Just like how we recommend using different rep ranges, like five to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30. There's kind of like a, it's a proxy for intensity. Same thing kind of goes here with the cardio. It's not a bad idea to have some kind of like low intensity cardio, a more moderate intensity, which is kind of like what Dr. Mike was talking about with the, maybe not the hardest interval training ever, but that would be like lactate threshold training or kind of like um, moderate intensity interval training. And then if you wanted to do something harder, like a high intensity interval training, that would also be good. And that's probably about what most people can manage maybe two or three times a week, especially when you start adding in the more moderate to higher intensity stuff because the recoverability becomes a limiting factor and the systemic fatigue becomes a limiting factor for your weight training. So that's where that comes into. Um, another couple things to consider is the modality. As Mike said, some are more joint intensive like running. Um, some might fuck up other aspects of your training. So I, so like in terms of like, um, What's a really good cardio modality? God damn, the rower is really good. You can do it in a variety of different intensities. It uses a shitload of muscle mass, but forget about back training or deadlifting within the next two days. You know, that's out of the question. So trade off there, right? Is it a good cardio modality? Yes. Is it going to impact your ability to do your weight training? Yes. So think about things like that. I'm a really big fan of um, the assault bike. You can use a lot of muscle mass. You can do interval training on it and it's all concentric. So there's no loaded eccentric, which is where you get a lot of the actual structural damage. So that's a really good one where you can kind of, you can go pretty hard on it and it's pretty low impact for the most part, aside from like the systemic fatigue. Um, yeah, so that's usually where I would start. If you have somebody who's like, I, I, I wanna do hypertrophy, but I also wanna be cardiovascularly fit. As Mike said, have a variety of activities and try and um, pick modalities that work well in conjunction with your existing training plan, and then use different intensity zones. You can, he asked if you can use heart rate. You can, heart rate's just a proxy for intensity. So that is something you can use. You can also just look at like how fast you're going, the power outage you're going, uh, how many intervals you did, the distance that you covered, the time it took to completion. All of those things are kind of intensity proxies that you can use and those will work fine too. Michael asked coaching. Michael is coaching. I don't know. All right. Michael, he's got Michael a pretty good, coaching. good little bod going there. Hey, what's up? What's up, Michael? Says, hey, Jen, quick question. You generally recommend following up a massing phase with a maintenance phase, which should be focused a bit more around strength training rather than hypertrophy to give the body a bit of a break. So my question is exactly how much of a focus should the strength training take? Are we taking talking straight up five by five type of situation or just a bit more focus on the compound stuff with fewer isolations? I'll be following it up with a mini cut and then another massing phase. Got a long ass off season ahead of me. If that plays any role on that note, what sort of training focus should be done during the mini cut? So training focus should be just all around training to make sure you don't lose muscle. And the big quintessential thing you have to have is a reduction in training volume. And then much more secondary is a reduction in the repetitions <laughs> because you want to sort of refresh your body to the metabolite stimulus. It's often a good idea. So I'd say like mostly sets of five to 10 reps. If you want to do five by five, that's really cool. But what James and I would probably say is don't pursue strength at such a high level that you beat yourself to shit joint wise in your, um, you know, your maintenance phase. And then all of a sudden you come back and you're kind of like. Uh, you know, I'm really sensitive to hypertrophy, but my elbows are falling off my body. So I'd say like, you know, very low number of sets, sets of mostly five to 10 reps, mostly compound stuff. Um, and then just enough volume to keep your muscle on your body. And after that, you're fucking, uh, good to go. And you know, that's for maintenance. And then for mini cut, the training is actually very similar. You just raise the volume just a little bit because mini cut is hypocaloric. It produces a catabolic stimulus. You have to raise muscle, uh, your volume just a little bit, but as low as volume as will keep your muscle on your body. And the training focus should again be whole body because you want to prevent muscle loss, James. Really good. Yeah. And so when we say like a strength focus, we don't, we're not talking about literally like training for strength to improve your one rep max. So that, that's like maybe um, a little bit more contextual. It's strength in, in the context of a hypertrophy program, meaning like you're doing the heaviest lifting for this particular macro cycle or however you want to scale it. Another thing that you, Michael, you might want to consider. Um, so I'm wondering, so it says you're doing a maintenance phase after your mass, which is fine, but then you're doing a mini cut after that. You might consider just taking either some like active rest if you just need to alleviate some fatigue, if that's the issue, because otherwise I, I don't see why you would need a maintenance phase in between. You could just go into mini cut and then do another mass phase, presumably, unless you're just like really worn out. Um, and, and in that case, you probably don't need to take like a whole 
mesocycle of strength training to get that effect, you could probably just take a week or two and then go into mini cut and then go right back into massing. So you might just be lengthening this timeline unnecessarily for yourself. Yeah, great point, James. I, in this structure, actually, it's absolutely true. I would recommend an active rest and then a mini cut, and then you get started on massing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Next up is Lord Vader. I don't think that's actually him in the in the thumbnail. What is that? It's red, as far as I can tell. Red with some kind of shape. It's All like, right. Yeah. Yeah. Hey guys, we're glad to hear you talking about adductors and how they're underdeveloped, and how and how when they're undeveloped, you can have skinny looking legs when viewed from the front. I have this exact problem: mm. solid quad ham development, but my inner thighs are lagging causing a skinny appearance from the front. Not much info on developing adductors that I can find, just a lot of body weight stretch, stretching types of exercises. I train legs two to three times per week, as well as having done several specialization blocks for quads and mostly to compounds, but it's not growing my adductors. Is there anything you can recommend other than sumo DLs or wide stand squats? So yeah, that's a good start um, that I can use to overload my adductors to get them growing. Thanks for all the great info to share with us. So I'd say yeah, two other things. Just all of your quad moves, I would switch to slightly wider stance, toes pointed a little bit more out. That would be a really good beginning to that. I would also do plenty of um, variety of lunges and a really great adductor blast, though it's not intended to, uh, for that, is the Bulgarian split squat, um, which just fucks up your adductors more than actually fucks up anything else. I would do a lot of those. Uh, well, you know, by a lot, I mean, you know, an appropriate volume you can recover from. And then in addition to that, you can go and do the, which is it, the good girl machine. Um, but I would say that's kind of a last resort um, that exercises raw stimulus magnitude is just really not super high. And it also means you have to do another exercise where if you do like lunges, you get glutes and quads and adductors, and they really fuck up your adductors. So I'd say more lunging, more split squats. And then anytime you do quads, I would take a wider stance uh, than you would prefer. And then I think that preferentially trains your adductors in most cases so much that you don't need any more. And if your adductors still need more volume, I would say you can add in one to two times a week, you can add the good girl machine. Yeah, really good recommendation there. I was thinking along the same lines. Um, I was going to say, you know, you might just be like really, really dialed in with your technique on kind of the flexion extension, pure sagittal plane movement. So I would try and use exercises that open up your degrees of freedom a little bit. And as Mike said, lunges, variations of split squats and things like that, just have a little bit more of that like kind of side to side component, which I think will help you uh, hit those a little bit better. You might just be like anthropometrically built or your technique is just so rock solid at hitting quads and hams in that very sagittal plane movement that you're just not getting a lot of stimulus on the inner th part of your thigh. So in order to do so, you have to use uh, movements which are I hate to say it this way, but kind of a little bit less stable and require a little bit more kind of side to side, less purely sagittal plane movement. So as Mike said, those are really good recommendations. All right, uh, Donald M Malestine. I was gonna read that as molesting, but- <laughs> Molestine. Oi, molesting. Says, hey docs, uh, former obese and I'm a former obese. I love, I love that I'm phrasing. I can't, I can't stop <laughs> yeah. looking at that. I'm a former I think you obese. forgot person in there, but no worries. Um, I'm a former obese and every time I bulk, I feel like I put on more fat than muscle, even though I'm training hard and smart, at least I like to think I do and gaining a very low rate. So my question is, are former obese people more likely to gain fat mass on a lean bulk? I can actually stop you right there and say the following. Formerly obese people are just more likely to gain fat mass no matter what, because you can't get obese without at least some decent genetics for it. Like if you take like the average super skinny Korean kid, for example, and be like, hey, get obese. Like he's going to try, try, try. And he's going to get like a little pudgy and it's going to be like, that's it. I can't eat anymore. I'm going to fucking kill myself. So you take the average Texan, haha, <laughs> Texas, Texas. And they're like, oh, watch this. Shazam, I'm obese. It just took me a year to gain 500 pounds or something like that. So yeah, if you, if you have been obese before, it means you're more likely to become obese again. For one reason is because you have some of those fat cells that you grew still around. But the other reason is just the same genetics that allowed you to become obese at first allow you to, or, you know, at least um, uh, from a, a facilitatory perspective can do it again. And then he asked, or could this be something else like water retention? It's almost certainly water retention is involved many times during bulking and actually at the end of a cut and the beginning of a bulk, um, people who are formerly obese tend to store a lot of water. Um, you'll be able to tell water from fat if you grab the tissue that's involved. If it jiggles a lot and it's really soft, it's a lot of water. If it doesn't jiggle as much, but it jiggles as much as fat does, but you squeeze on it and it kind of squeezes back and it's really hard. You're kind of like, okay, well, that's actually fat. There's a lot of wiggle room today, a lot of nuance. But um, another thing is like, if you gain seemingly a lot of fat at the beginning of a mass, but then as the mass goes, you actually look 
kind of a little bit drier and you seem to not gain much, that's probably body water. Uh, but if it's something that you start out a bulk pretty lean, you're lean for a few weeks, and then over time you really start to get much fatter, then it's probably fat. Um, and then he says, thanks, keep up these amazing Q and A's. So Donald, you know, best of luck to you. You just have to do your best and it's good that you're doing all the, all the right things. Um, you're all, everyone gains fat when they gain muscle. Um, and for especially advanced athletes, most of what you gain out of bulk will be fat and not muscle. Um, you know, people say, oh, you know, I'm up 20 pounds after my contest weight or whatever, deep into the off season, like motherfuckers didn't gain 20 pounds of muscle. They didn't even gain 10 or 15. It's like maybe five. Right. So it's okay to gain predominantly fat. After that, you take the fat off and then you restart the process and you get what you get. James. Yeah. And this you might have kind of a, a shit storm genetic situation too, where you might not be like the most muscle gain prone genetics either, you know, so you might kind of have a situation where you're prone to putting on a lot of fat mass and just don't have the greatest muscle gain genetics in the world. So there's, I mean, the, you, you're dealt the cards that you got, right? So it sounds like you're, you're, you're smart. Like you obviously got a lot of the weight off and are in a place where you feel comfortable doing mass phases and then cutting back down. So to me, it sounds like you're doing everything right. You're conscious of the fact that maybe you're gaining a little bit of extra fat mass than then seems reasonable. And so you're taking it at a slow rate. And honestly, I can't really think of much better to do at that point. Like you might just have to have more firm caps in terms of body composition on where you want to end your masses. If you find that you get too fat too quickly comparatively to our recommendations and that's okay. But it seems like you're, I mean, otherwise it seems like you're doing everything right. I would just keep doing what you're doing and just know that like, yeah, this just might be the cards that you're dealt, but you can still be leaner and more muscular than you are now. It's just going to take a little bit of extra effort. Yeah, I wish it worked super, super awesome. But yeah. Anyway. Sometimes sometimes it's just the, the cards that you're dealt, you know? And you just got to do the best with what you got. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, Dr. McBungle Nuts. That's a real person. That's definitely not a fake profile. Yeah. I hate these stupid fucking YouTube names. All right, Dr. McBungleNuts asks us, I'm interested in building muscle and building conditioning slash cardio slash stamina for basketball. A very simple approach would be to take a six month block of training and focus on building muscle, hypertrophy stop training. Then another six month block to focus on building conditioning, running. When my focus is on building conditioning in order to maintain muscle, I will train at all body parts at maintenance volume. First question, does a lot of cardio and general conditioning for a sport change the MV landmark? in any meaningful way compared to what the MV landmark would be when doing a hypertrophy training maintenance phase without intense bouts of cardio and training for conditioning for sport. For example, if my MV for quads during hypertrophy training maintenance phase is six sets, would it be maybe around three or four sets because of how hard the legs would be worked during the conditioning and cardio training? Or could it be higher for any reason, which I can't think of? Yes, it would be higher for any reason, which you can't think of. That reason is if you do primarily cardio, especially more um, less on the high intensity interval spectrum, like sprints, and more on the conditioning that involves like longer durations and lower intensities, your maintenance volume would actually have to be higher because it has to counterbalance the catabolic stimulus. So instead of maybe six set, uh, sets, it could be eight sets or something like that. So that's the first thing I'd say. Um, and then he says, perhaps to pacify the gods of gains for the sin of not training hypertrophy around when us would do more sets. I also figure this depends on the body part. Upper body MV would not be affected like lower body. Correct. Um, unless you're doing upper body cardio. Um, and then upper body maintenance volume would probably be pretty similar, but because you're expanding a lot of calories, uh, you'd have to raise your calories concomitantly. Uh, so I wouldn't forget about that. And then my second set of questions relates to maintaining the cardio I just achieved in the last six months. During the next six months, I spend focusing on gaining muscle seems to me that maintaining muscle and making great conditioning cardio stamina gain is much easier to do than just to maintain conditioning cardio stamina and make great muscle gains. In other words, hypertrophy training at maintenance volume would bring down my cardio, wouldn't bring down my cardio tr running training MRV very much, as well as the interference effect of being negligible, but cardio running at training MV would bring down my hypertrophy training MRV by a significant margin. Yes, that's true as well as the interference effect would be more of an issue. Is my hypothesis true? Yep, probably. If it's false, my question ends here. If so, can you talk about why this is? If it, <laughs> that question does not actually end. <laughs> if it's true, then it would seem 
to be a fool's errand to try to maintain your cardio while focusing on building muscle, unless you absolutely need to perform your sport at that given time. And then of course you need to maintain your conditioning. James is getting pissed. How can I decide the right baseline of cardio to do while I'm focused on muscle building so that I'm not completely losing all of my cardio gains while feeling good uh, that I'm making good amount of muscle gains and not spinning my wheels, trying to train both. So my, my simple uh, short answer is the following to, to your last question is what you want to do is you want to reduce your cardio by maybe half of what you normally do and increase your uh, your training on the hypertrophy side to enough to grow. And then what you need to do is consistently uh, through your performances and RPEs of cardio, every week you're going to assess, am I losing any cardio ability or is my cardio ability staying the same? And if your cardio ability is staying the same, like your, your mile time is the same, or just as a very easy example, um, then you're doing clearly enough to keep it. And then maybe you could try lowering the cardio a little bit. And if it takes a hit, then you have to raise it back up. And by that way, you find your maintenance cardio volume. It's very easy to find. You just start cutting your cardio down until you start to get worse. And then you bring it back up and wherever you calibrate to where this is where I don't get better or worse, that's maintenance level of cardio. And then what you have left in your systemic fatigue for like systemic volume allotment is you a lot towards hypertrophy training as needed. Then maybe the case that you rise up to between halfway between your MEV and MA uh, and MRV as hypertrophy training. And you say, well, how do I get all the way up to my MRV? It seems to be impossible because I do so much cardio. Like I can't hit my local muscle MRV is and the answer would be, well, that's correct. And that is the interference effect systemically um, it literally shown to you. Like, this is why you're too, you're too tired to do all this stuff. You can't do it all. So you'll have to understand that, well, for my level of cardio, maintaining it takes so much work that I'm literally inhibited from making gains uh, by recovery alone. So that's my answer. James? Yeah, so there's a little bit of context here that's important to note. So it depends, you know, okay, so he's talking about basketball. So that was right in the beginning. Yeah, so the interference effects of doing any of these things, right, uh, for basketball, is only significant if you are trying to pursue them to their maximal extent independently, right? So here's what I'm saying is like, if you are trying to grow your legs as much as possible, then your question of like, does maintaining uh, my cardio regiment interfere with my ability to do that? Yes, but uh, the missing piece of this puzzle here is that you never would do that. If you are a competitive basketball player, you are always going to have elements of your sport practice, your cardio, and whatever kind of um, body composition related strength or uh, muscle mass uh, training that you are doing. That's always going to be part of the milieu of your training. And as you said, you're going to be kind of dialing them up and down a little bit accordingly, depending on your needs analysis and your goals. But just for an example, so like, is it, uh, if you are somebody who is like a Dr. Mike, and the question is, um, would I would my MV change to for, for, for my legs so that they don't decondition if I add cardio? Yes. What about for your kind of intermediate basketball player? I would actually say no. Why? Because you're not actually pursuing maximal leg size. You're nowhere close to your genetic potential for maximal leg size. So I would say you're probably relatively unchanged. So if you do cardio, is it going to enhance your ability to achieve an MV? Only if you're doing like sprint interval type stuff. Um, you know, along those lines. So if you take your average basketball player, soccer player, rugby player, baseball player, et cetera, pick and choose whatever you want. You would have a hard time making a case to me that their cardio, whatever it is that they're doing, whether they're emphasizing it or kind of just doing a maintenance volume is truly limiting their potential in any one of their other fitness areas because they're just not that well developed in any one of their other fitness areas. Now, if you are somebody who is more biased, so let's say you are a basketball player who really relies on being strong and powerful and that's part of your game and you execute that as part of your tactical strategy as a basketball player then you could probably make a case of saying like you know i have to kind of strike the right balance here with my cardio because i need to be that really fast agile guy and when i do cardio i really feel like i start slowing down a lot okay i can accept that right if you're a kind of a more just normal kind of well-rounded player I would have a hard time accepting like, oh, you know, I'm doing the an MV amount of conditioning. Is that really going to impact my ability in the off season to put on more muscle in my legs? Like, nah, <laughs> you could probably do just fine. Why? Because you're an intermediate, which is totally fine. And you're in a sport that generally um, favors well-roundedness. Like you have to be both skillful, tactical, strong, agile, 
and enduring to some extent. So you can't, the reason I was getting kind of pissed and not, I wasn't actually pissed, but the reason I got the skeptical eye when, when Mike was talking was because I think the way that you're framing the context of the question is like, if I'm trying to pursue any one of these things to their fullest capacity, well, it's like, you never are going to do that as a basketball player. You're always going to accept that there's some level of compromise on each one of these things that are inherent. You can still dial them up and down, but you're never going to not do cardio. You're never not going to do weights. You're never not going to be playing basketball. So I can't pursue like leg growth to its fullest extent at any given time, unless I'm not a serious basketball player. And at that point, why did we frame it in the context of basketball? So you see what I'm saying? So it's kind of one of these like silly arguments. Um, but it, overall, I think if you're an average, you know, intermediate player, um, you will have to adjust some of your numbers accordingly. But to say that like, um, uh, my, my MV of cardio is going to significantly impact your like MRV for your other body parts. I'd be like, eh, is it going to impact it? Yeah. Is it going to like cut it in half? No, you're probably going to have to make some adjustments, but they're not going to be massive. Very well said, James. Very well said. Thank Dr. You. McBungle, that's, I didn't mean it when I said your name is stupid. It is stupid. <laughs> right? That's the point, right? So no offense. All right. Theony. Ooh. Theon E. Very simple question, very simple answer. Hey, docs, does neck training for size increase the risk of getting sleep apnea in the future? It does, but you have to have some genetics to get sleep apnea. You probably also have to have some body fat in most cases. Um, and, uh, you know, it's it, your neck has to be objectively quite large in order for you to be candidate for apnea. But there's a lot of genetic variation about that. So I have like roughly a 22 inch neck and I just don't have sleep apnea. I got super lucky. I know people with 18 inch necks, 17 inch necks that have full blown CPAP required sleep, uh, sleep apnea. So I would say if you, if whatever risk you have of sleep apnea with genetics and body fat and lifestyle, et cetera, if you have a bigger muscular neck, it absolutely increases your chance for sleep apnea. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. All right. Next up is Sergei Stajanovich with a big letter S. It's like Superman, except very few people can pronounce his whole name. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Sergei Stajanovich. <laughs> anyway, glad he's here. Um, hey, Doc, simple question. Do I count RIR, RPE on the first set or the last set? Are all of them combined and then just take an average? Thank you for your great content. So um, usually... Uh, yeah, it's a, <laughs> so it depends on, so it says count, which means uh, to me that you're doing things and then you're trying to assess afterwards what the RRPE was. Um, I think uh, another way of training is to try to target one in advance, but in either case, what James and I probably prefer is all sets have their own independent values and you don't have to average them. You just look at them all together. Uh, like uh, that's it. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, it's kind of like saying, but how many grams of, should I count grams of proteins, carbs, or fats in my meal? You count them all. They're like, should I average them? Like, no, no. Like, what about calories? Is that kind of an average? Like, yeah, you could actually use that also, but all three numbers are independent, independently wise. So for example, and here's why we don't average them. Uh, if you have some R uh, RPEs, like let's say an RPE eight average over the course of five sets, uh, but it's all eights, okay? Eight average and every single set was eight versus you have a situation in which you have RPE of like a few sixes at the beginning, a few eights in the middle, and then around eight in the middle, and then a few tens at the end. Average is still eight, but those 10 RPEs at the end are gonna cause way more disproportionate fatigue. So even with an eight RPE average, condition one where it's eight for all of them is gonna be way less fatiguing than condition two where just two of the sets are RPE 10. So uh, because of that sort of exponential rise of fatigue, averaging doesn't give you a very good picture. Um, it, it's kind of similar to saying, you know, like here's a country in which, you know, there's a population of two people and they make, one makes $35,000, the other makes $45,000, average income of 40,000. Okay, here's another country where one person makes $0 and the other person makes 80,000, average 40. Both countries have the same general like economic situation. Like, no, they don't, <laughs> not even close. So, uh, so I wouldn't average them. I don't think that, I think that actually washes away important data. I would just collect one uh, at a time and then look it over and see how that matches your goals, James. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Sergey, you would take you would just do it for each individual set. Um, kind of looking at them as like a collective or averaging them is useful in things where it's kind of difficult to assess. So, like for example, would be like a sport practice activity. You might say we're shooting for this activity. We're shooting for an RPE of seven or eight. But there's going to be times when you're active. There's going to be times when you're resting. So we're kind of just broadly speaking, it should be roughly this hard, right? But for sets for hypertrophy training, you can just 
they're very easy to assess and you can look at them as individual like components, right? And you say for each set, I'm gonna look at the difficulty and then I'm gonna either log what happened or like Mike said in the beginning, what we prefer to do is to shoot a target for yourself and then try and match that across all the sets. And usually that means your reps or weight that you're using might have to change to match that RIR, which is the preferred way for hypertrophy training. But yeah, so like the way that you're doing it might be like, if I'm coaching some rugby guys and we're doing a, a drill, I might say like, here's what we're going for today, guys. I want you to set a pace for this drill. That's like an RP of eight out of 10, which is pretty hard. Um, but you wouldn't do that for like a weight training session or for even just for like one exercise grouping, like a bench press, you would treat each set as an individual set. Right, and next up is, make sure I get this right, uh, Rui Nagby, R-O-E-E. -E. Oh. I'm going to start for that one, That's I think. Oh, there he is. Okay. So, uh, Rui says, hey, Docs, thanks for all the quality information. Of course, our pleasure. Are there benefits to taking a deload for a specific muscle group or squat, bench, deadlift, lift? I've seen this in the gym uh, last week, and it's been on my mind ever since. Uh, there are absolutely, and um, <laughs> you saw somebody like dead, deloading his 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 deadlift, and he was like, "Oh my god!" Cal calculus equations and shit. What does it? <laughs> what does it mean? <laughs> All right. So there was um, what's that guy? I forgot his name. There's a guy that makes like um, physical memes on Instagram. He makes like memes and he actually posts them places. And one was like. I was having a dream last night that I was making out with Garfield the cat. What does this mean? If you can help me, please. <laughs> so, um, yes. Oh. And usually it's good to do not hold deloads, but what we call recovery half weeks, where for half a week of training, uh, however many sessions you do in that half week, be it one or even three for that muscle group or that lift, you just take like half of the volume, half of the reps, et cetera, sometimes half the load. And then a half week later, you come back and you start progressing uh, as if it was, you know, a week or two before that. And uh, that's totally a, a tenable strategy. It's a very good strategy. If like, you know, you really fucked up your progression on a muscle and you assume the MRV was really high, but it wasn't. It was like the rest of your body's fucking golden, but your biceps are fucking done. It's like you don't have to deload everything for that. You just have to deload your biceps. And because local fatigue tends to be very easy to get rid of versus systemic, and because systemic fatigue is really easy to reduce if it's just stemming from one muscle group, just a half week is often good enough. And I'm not saying it's always good enough, but I think half a week um, is, is usually very good. So what you do is you would deload just your bicep workouts. Maybe you would deload your back a little bit to really take the onus off of all, all the pulling work your biceps are doing. Everything else you would train normally, and then you would come back and start with a little bit of a lower volume, maybe two thirds of what you left off because you're going to be a little bit more sensitive to volume, but you can start your weight progression back where you started it from, RAR is back where you started it or, or left off from, and then everything's uh, good after that. Yeah. So Roy, two, one thing to just watch out for. The, the reason, the way that people fuck this up, and it sounds kind of goofy, like, how do you fuck this up? Well, the reason is that they will kind of pick and choose muscle groups and just deload them for a week and then kind of pick and choose another one the next week and then pick and choose another one next week. And then essentially, they're just kind of like in a state of constantly overreaching various muscle groups or systemically overreaching, when the reality is, is they probably could just benefit from taking a full deload and getting a nice, clean, fresh start. So what you don't want to do is be like, whoa, boy that leg session like really wore, wore me out. I'm gonna deload legs this week and keep training upper body. And then surprise, you're gonna have some really great upper body training sessions that week. And you're like, damn, I hit some huge PRs and now I'm like really overreached on my upper body. I'm gonna deload that this next week. And then you see what I'm saying, it kind of goes into the circular thing. So it's okay when you kind of, um, you overreach on accident. That's what we call non-functional overreaching. Like you didn't mean to do it. It just kind of happened on accident. And you're like, fuck, now what do I do? That's when taking those half weeks or those kind of mini deloads can be handy. So long as that it allows you to stay on the trajectory that you're set for yourself. What you don't want to do is this like constant, like auto-regulation, circular deloading all the time kind of thing. Because then your systemic fatigue is always high and that's really bad. Yeah. All right, Ahan Shan Wakar. Woo. All right. Hey guys, love the channel. I was wondering about RIR. We know that within five to 30 reps training for the same RIR, let's say two RIR produces equivalent hypertrophy. Yep, roughly that's probably true in most cases. But if two reps of an eight rep max weight produces more tension, okay, if two reps of an eight rep max weight produces more tension than two reps of a 20 rep max weight, if we do six reps at two RIR, Aren't we further away from our max ability to produce force failure than we 
then if we do 18 reps at two RIR, my reasoning is that the first scenario, our muscles still have the ability to crank out two more reps with our eight RM. But second scenario, while the RIR is the same, our muscles only have the ability to crank out two more reps with our 20 RM. Uh, I'd say that's a, a quite valid concern, potentially, theoretically. So what, what basically uh, Hannah's saying is that relative to the number of reps you're doing, uh, two RIR at eight reps is actually uh, significantly further away from failure than two RIR from, uh, you know, so like 20 reps or something. I will say there's there's two things that come to mind initially. One is it's it's been, I think, pretty well illustrated that, yes, everything is roughly equivalent, but you got to go a little closer to failure when you're training at lighter loads than when you're training at heavier loads to get the equivalent hypertrophy. So I think because of that sort of discovery or that observation, your so your assumption is actually correct and vetted. And, and that's where one of these things where like, you can grow real well from three or four RIR with your 10 RM, but like three or four RIR with your 30 RM might actually not be ultra hard. And you're like, I don't, I don't know. I felt like I was really just getting into it here. So I think it might be, I think what you're saying could very well be true. And it's also supported by those observations. Um, another thing is uh, I think studying this is incredibly difficult because that close to failure with just slightly different reps and, and load gets to be so nitty gritty that detecting the differences becomes almost impossible mm -hmm. from a research perspective. So I would say like, if that is something you observe in your own rep, in your own training, like, you know, yeah, three RIR for sets of 30 just doesn't cut it for me, go a little harder and then make that adjustment yourself. I just wouldn't be um, looking out for literature to confirm this exact thing that you're saying anytime super soon, because gee whiz, you know, um, the error on RIR for estimates for most people is already bounded outside of this thing you're trying to discover. Um, it's like trying to, you know, see something with a, a, a like a, a microscope and the resolution is just like bigger than or smaller than the thing you're trying to see. You might see something here and there, but nothing reliably. So I think you can make a very good point. I think it's probably a correct point, but I, I think our observations actually support that idea. Yeah, one thing to add, like Mike said, RIR already has a litany of errors. And then when you start getting into the like, what is my 20 RM or what is my actual 30 RM, you have to actually wonder like, what was the limiting factor for them even doing that assessment? More often than not, it's just like they're got out of breath. They're just pissed off that they're having to do this ridiculous thing. You know, and I'm dead serious. Like if you ask Mike, Mike and I to do a 30 RM like machine oh, curl, yeah. you get to about 20 reps and be like, just like, I can keep going, but I'm at my wits end of this stupid activity. This sucks, um, you, that kind of stuff. So again, it's like riddled with all these weird errors. And so when you are assessing, you know, something like three RIR with your 20 RM, like the margin of error on that is just so crazy and goofy. It's an interesting thought experiment, uh, Ahan. One thing to consider too is that within that five to 30 reps, we say, you know, they're, most of them, assuming the RIR is between four and zero, are roughly equivalent. It does seem that a l biasing on the heavy side does give like a non statistically significant, slightly more, a better stimulus. And that's only significant in the sense of like accumulating large volumes of those reps. So, Although five to 30, you know, we say any one of those sets is roughly equivalent. You know, if you're biasing a little bit more on the heavy side, you might be getting a slight advantage in terms of, for the same RIR in terms of growth stimulus. It's not a statistically significant effect more often than not, but you could say there's a potential practical effect there. And big surprise that it holds out in the real world. Like you see lots of people getting really big and strong. Powerlifter is a great example, lifting with relatively heavy weights. So it holds up. I wouldn't um, perseverate too much on these RIR type questions, just because Mike said they're hard to measure, they're riddled with user error, and it's just not something that we can do really reliably. Oh, lots to say. Last, but absolutely possibly least, because this question, can solve, <laughs> I don't know yet, um, is ya boy, and that's just called ya boy. That's just what? Ya boy? Oh, there it is. Uh, so he asks, I'm going on a bulk for the first time in my life after cutting from 200 pounds to 145. Woo! I want, I obviously want to minimize fat gain, but I'd also like to at least keep up my cardio. Is it possible to eat slightly more on training days, four times a week and eat regularly on rest days, the days I do my cardio and thus be in a slight surplus by the end of the week, uh, and get almost maximal gains. So it's, 
So I can't tell you about almost maximal gains, but if you eat a little bit more in your training days and you eat a little bit less on your off days, as long as your net surplus uh, over the week, or sorry, your net calories over the week, your average per day calories over the week are in a uh, surplus, then you're going to gain muscle. Um, I just would, uh, this is one of those things where normally this wouldn't be the answer, but if you're going to do something like this, where you pulse and tile your days a lot, I would absolutely log your shit. Uh, pretty meticulously to make sure you're actually in a surplus because you could spend weeks being like, I'm in a surplus and then haven't gained any weight. And you're like, just kidding. <laughs> That's why James and I are really not big fans of, uh, you know, the idea that you can gain at like 0.2% your body weight per week or some shit like that. Like how the fuck you could spend a month training and all of it disappears in water weight fluctuations. Um, yes. And then you're like, oh, I yes. guess I did a month of nothing. So whereas you, if you gain a little too fast, you will define that out in two or three weeks and then you can easily bring that down and then be in a good position. So, um, so we should, a new term, a minimum detectable surplus. <laughs> I'm not going to that's not a term. We're not going to have that, but, uh, but there's, there's a concept there. That's really true. So make sure you're on that upper end. Uh, you're above the surplus line that's detectable versus below it. Because if you know, if you're cons consistently presenting a surplus daily, it becomes pretty obvious pretty fast that you're in a surplus. But if you do a lot of highs and lows, the net surplus could be so low or so not a surplus that you could be spinning your wheels for weeks and have no idea. James? Yeah, I absolutely agree with Mike on that one. The other thing I don't like, I mean, you can, you can do this. And as long as it's done, like, you know, I'd say reasonably, um, fine. I think it's fine. Um, where it becomes unreasonable is where you see really big peaks and valleys in the pulsatility of your daily intake. So this is where you could probably fuck this up is where your rest days are really low and your training days are really high. And then you can actually get into a problem of like, you might actually just be getting like real fat <laughs> on some days of the week unnecessarily and uh, not actually offsetting it enough on those, on those rest days. So I would just be careful of any like really big sways in your daily calories. Now it's, it's, you should pair it to your activity levels and that's fine. So it is normal for you to maybe have a little bit more on your training days, a little bit less on your non-training days. So that's perfectly fine. What I don't wanna see is like, you know, hu humongous deltas of like 3000 calorie change uh, across the days. Cause then at that point you might run into some other problems. You know, and another thing real quick, James, while we're on the subject is if you wanna put your best foot forward your boy <laughs> i feel uh, strange um sort of calling that but um you, you, the best real is or one of the realizations to make that's pretty important is that the best gains you're going to make theoretically is through a rather consistent small daily presentation of a surplus your body swims in that shit. There's no counter signaling. Um, and your, your body and muscles can really settle into the idea like, okay, lots of food around. This is good. And, yeah, you know, muscle growth curves last several days. If one of those is a high day, very high, and one of those is a very low, the growth curve gets muddled a bit because on the low day, it's going to be like, oh, fuck this. I'm reducing my shit. Apparently we're starving. And there's some amount of that growth you can't make up with another high day. Some of it you can, yes. some of it you can't. So, you know, if you're serious about bulking, you could do five surplus days and two deficit days. You can do, you know, uh, sorry, uh, five, yeah, so six and one, uh, but but four and three, uh, gee, you know, especially if it's interspersed, um, it's it's rough. And it, it's if you wanted to get as jacked as possible, I would say don't do that. Um, you know, a consistent presentation of small surplus is probably marginally better than an average presentation of a surplus with lots of pulsatility through the week with deficits and surpluses. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, Dr. Mike, I know you have a, a time limit, so I think, or should we start wrapping this one up? I think that's it. I think that yeah. was, uh, did you want to? There was a, a, a bit of housekeeping and, and Dr. Mike, I, I'm sorry, I, I was looking at my phone earlier because I just remembered that I had to, Scott, our sound guy, reminded me to make an announcement and hopefully you can clean this up a little bit for me. But the Q&As going forward are going to be on a new kind of uh, system that we're using on our YouTube channel. We're gonna start introducing the subscription channel. Mike, do you wanna start talking about that a little bit? And yeah. then uh, mm -hmm. this will be the last Q&A going forward. That's just going to be on our general YouTube channel. The next Q&As are going to be on our subscription channel. And I'm going to pass it over to Mike so he can talk a little bit more about, little, more about that in some detail. Yes. So I think what we're probably going to end up doing is we are going to end up answering just a few questions from the general Q&A from just general folks on YouTube. 
and then most of the questions we answer, uh, we're going to start doing these, um, you know, uh, probably at the same frequency, maybe a little bit more often, but we're going to answer mostly member questions. Um, and if you're going to want to join a membership soon, that'll be an option, like literally within a couple of, uh, well, actually, by the time you see this, it might already be an option or which is within a couple of days. And it's going to be cheap, 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 like like for sure less than $10 and maybe in some cases less, like around five or less dollars per month. And then you instantly are in a pool pool of people, which there's fewer of you to compete for best questions, still the same upvoting system, but we're going to switch to answering more member questions uh, and fewer questions from the general audience. And we're going to see how that goes. We're always flexible to changing back or modifying, but um, we'll probably still take a few questions here and there from uh, general folks, but members are going to receive priority, kind of like people do in their Q&As for like Patreon members receive priority. Basically, James and I are porn stars and we need your money. So uh, I mean, that's how we started this episode and that's how we're going to end it on porno. Yep. Uh, okay. So thanks for uh, bearing with us, guys. We'll probably have some more announcements on that to come in the near future. But uh, Scott pinged me and was like, don't forget to make the announcement. So I don't want to get on his bad side. He is a, uh, a terrorist. Yeah. Um, all right, folks, thank you so much for joining us for the good questions. As always, Dr. James and Dr. Mike, we're signing off for this one. See you next time.